Okay, so how is everyone today? Okay, so shh, 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 shh. last time we proved uh, Bolzano-Varistrauss theorem. Terrific. Can someone s tell us what that theorem is about in plain language? What is it saying? Yeah, is that part of it? Part of it is saying is that there must be a convergent subsequence. So shh, 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 shh. part of the virus, Balzano virus rust theorem is that there has to be a convergent subsequence. That's the conclusion. But what are the hypotheses that are necessary to come to that conclusion? So the, se the sequence itself has to live inside of a set. This set must be closed, but it must also be what? Bounded. So if the set is closed and also bounded, let's, now it's like nap time. So a set, a subset of Rn for finite n that is closed and bounded. Mathematicians have such a fond place in their heart for such sets that we give them their own special name. What's their name? Compact. Compact. So if you, have a, if you have a sequence which is a subset of a compact set, then what? There must be a subsequence which converges in that compact set. So what that's saying generally is that if you have a compact set and you have any subset, any subset which, which has infinitely many elements at all, then there must, it must be at least one place where points start to accumulate, where they get really close to each other. Okay, good. So now we're kind of going to leave the abstract things. Well, the, the abstract things that are like, like the bolzano weierstrass theorem is abstract. Uh, and we're going to move to more familiar territory. So now we're in section 1.7, which is titled something like derivatives or something like that. Okay. So as a reminder, definition. So this is the definition of derivative that you already know in the case where the functions have signature like reals to reals. So this, this is something that you all already know. So let, let uh, u, a subset of the reals, be open. Uh, let point A in U and let F be a function from U to the reals. Then the derivative at A, <coughs> so the derivative at A, derivative of F at A is the limit as uh, h goes to 0 of 1 over h, f of a plus h minus f of a, like so. <clears throat> okay, so this is the derivative of f at a if this exists. Obviously. And then the way we denote it is with f prime at a. So there's nothing, nothing at all strange about this definition. This is the usual definition. The only thing that might be just minor, minorly strange is that instead of writing all over h, I wrote multiplication by 1 over h, which is obviously the same, but you might not be, too, you might not be accustomed to writing it that way. OK, so there's nothing new about this definition. Uh, the same things that, that you already knew still apply 
and that is uh, in the first place, in the first place, uh, to have a derivative at, <laughs> at a point, a function must first be defined there, right? <laughs> so uh, things where, where students get a little bit messed up is things like this. So, so this is the, the definition of derivative, and then uh, if, if f is differentiable at every a in u, then f is differentiable on u. So that's just to say that if f is differentiable at a whole bunch of points, then, then that's, what we're, that's what we mean when we, when we say that f is a differentiable function. Okay, but, but, please consider, uh, how about the function f of x is uh, the square root of x? Uh, well, so in particular, uh, the square root of x looks like this. more or less. So how about, according to this definition that we have written on the page, is, is f differentiable, say, here, if this is uh, 3? Is, is f going to be differentiable there? Yeah, right. It's going to be differentiable there because, uh, well, we can, we can, in a slow and tedious process, actually compute it directly. We could do it. Okay, how about is, is f differentiable at zero? Is f differentiable at zero? Why or why not? It is, it is continuous there. Okay, ev there's even a more fundamental problem. Okay, okay, I like that. So consider, let, let, let's think of that for a minute. So if you think of the parabola at the origin, the parabola is differentiable at the origin, right? And what's its derivative there? Zero. And this is, this is, the, this is the inverse function of just half of the parabola. And if you were to try and draw a tangent line, like if, 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 you, know, if you were under duress and someone said, I've, you have to do it, then you, you'd kind of be, be pressed to kind of make it vertical. Which, which would mean that, that it doesn't exist. But there's even, from a definitional point of view, there's even a more fundamental reason why this function is not differentiable. Yes? Um, there's no age that exists. Like, um, I guess it's like the, I don't say it's not open, but like there's. What's not open? Like there doesn't exist an age greater than zero that you can have because any a plus age where age is negative is going to be. Um, okay, there's even, there's even a more fundamental reason. Yes? Zero is not in the open interval. Thank you. Right? What's the, what is the natural domain of the square root function? Zero to infinity. So, it, it, uh, and do we include zero or not? In the natural domain. In the natural domain. Okay, this is its natural domain. Now, so is, is zero contained in an open interval? Is this function defined on an open interval around zero? No, it's not. It's not. You can't, you can't fit an open interval around zero within its natural domain. So for those of, those of you that were saying something like, well, something from the left, that's, that's more, or less, more or less the right idea. But the, the, the exact idea is that the input, zero, is not contained in an open set. There's no open ball that you can put that the input zero in so that you can calculate the derivative there. This is the problem. Okay, yes? Gen generally speaking, 
generally speaking, yes. However, in the in the in the real, sometimes you try and do this left and right business. However, the problem of it is in, is is that in RN now there's now there's a multitude of directions to approach from, not just not just two. Okay, good. Similarly, on the definition of continuity, uh, I, a lot of y'all were thrown by that. You were you were disturbed that the hyperbola, the reciprocal function, is continuous. Okay. Um, well, I have a question for you. How about f? Is this the square root? Is it con is it a continuous function? Yeah. Is it continuous right there? The the question is wrong, right? My question is wrong. Is the function continuous here? That's a red apple. <laughs> right. Thank you. So the the question itself is wrong. So over asking whether or not this function is continuous over here is is a wrong question. Okay, because it's it, it fails to understand the definition of continuity. The same thing with the reciprocal function. Okay. <clears throat> Good. The the reciprocal function at 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 input zero anyway. Okay. So uh you know, imagine that we went over several derivatives, right? The derivatives of polynomials, the derivatives of sine and cosine and the trig functions and logarithm. All of that's now imported into, into our class. We, all, we know all of that now. Okay. <clears throat> so definition. Uh, definition. This is uh, the partial derivative. partial derivative of functions from Rn, <coughs> pardon me, with signature Rn to R. So now, the previous definition, the previous definition was scalars to, uh, to scalars, the previous one. Now we're doing vectors to scalars, but notably, notably one of the sides is still scalar, right? The, 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 the target side, the domain side is scalar. Okay, <clears throat> so what we're, what we're thinking of uh, is the following, is that, is that uh, we'll say let u be a subset of Rn, which is open. Let a be uh, in u, and let f be a function from u to R. Then, the, def the uh, partial derivative, <coughs> in particular, the kth, so k, kth, partial derivative. Of f at uh, a is the following limit is the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over <coughs> h. So, so far it looks just like, just like uh, the other one, right? So far. Uh, then what we'll do is we'll do f of a plus. And now what we want to say, what we want to say is that we're only going to move, we're only going to move the kth coordinate. So, for example, we might be talking about a problem in R10, and we only want to move the seventh coordinate. We just want to move the seventh one. Okay, or we might be, we might be talking about a problem in R51, and we only want to move the 24th coordinate. Right? Just, just one of them. So, what is the, what's the name of the basis vector that points in, in, in the kth direction? EK, right? So, what we're going to do is we're going to add EK, and notice I left myself a little bit of horizontal space there, minus f of a. But now we want to say that we're going to move, we're going to only move h. We're going to move an amount h in the kth direction. So how do we do that? All right, we'll multiply this by h. Multiply that by h. And of course, this is only defined for when 1 is less or equal to k is less or equal to n, right? 
it doesn't make us sense. It doesn't make sense to talk about the 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 twelfth partial derivative, the partial derivative with respect to variable twelve if there's only five variables. Okay. So when this exists. Uh, it is denoted with big D subscript K F at A. So, we have to give up the prime thingy. We have to give up the prime thingy because if you write the prime thing, if you just, if you just were to write prime, then you wouldn't know that it, was, that it had to do with K in, in instead of some other one, right? Because there's multiple variables, if you write the prime, you don't know which variable you're talking about. So for those of you that are at a bit of a loss at this, uh, let's, consider, let's consider the case that A looks like, say, um, 1, 2, 3, A1, A2, A3. And let's consider the case that K is 2. So in the case that K is 2, we're talking about basis vector 2. And in R3, what are the coordinates of basis vector 2? 0, 1, 0. Okay. Then, uh, supposing that's the case, then what would, what would H multiplied by basis vector 2 be? 0, H, 0. Because, because you multiply the zeros, they're still 0, and you multiply the 1, that's H. So as a result, a plus H E2, what would, what would be its coordinates? Like so, right? Okay. <clears throat> so any question about uh, this definition? Okay, so I could, I, I could give an example. I could say something like, well, um, Example. Um, how about what would be a good one? We'll just do this. Do this one. So f of x and y. So we're going to input something from R two, and now let's say that uh, the output is some polynomial uh, like <coughs> x squared plus 3xy squared uh, plus 8, say. <coughs> okay, then I could ask, well, what is, uh, what is d2 of f at x and y? So in the first place, it's a polynomial, so surely, surely it exists, this thing I'm requesting. So what am I asking for? Yeah, I want you to do all of this uh, partial with respect to y, okay, the, se the second variable. Okay, so what's the, what's the partial of x squared with respect to y? Zero. Zero. And then what's, what's the partial of this term? Zero. Very good. And then the partial of this last term? Seven. Okay, good, zero. So, <clears throat> so any question about this? So some of you might be wondering, well, are we going to use the fancy d thingy? Are we gonna are we gonna do this? And the answer is no, we're gonna avoid that notation like the plague. Okay? So we're we're not gonna we're not gonna use that for for a variety of reasons. So this this notation can be made far more consistent uh, than than the other one. Yes? Is it ever permissible to write the big D and then the subscript rather than being a two B or Y? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 as long as it's clear from the context, okay. yeah. So, so to, to rephrase, it sounded like you were asking, would, would this kind of thing make sense? Yeah, yeah that, that, that's perfectly intelligible, yeah. That would mean partial derivative with respect to the, to the x variable, yeah. Okay, good. <clears throat> so what if... What if we have uh, what if we have vector-valued function? 
So something like this. Uh, so definition. This is now partial derivative. When, when the signature looks like Rn to Rm. So the previous two definitions, uh, the, the signature of the range was scalars, but now the signature of the range um, is vectors. OK? <clears throat> so now what? Well, believe it or not, it's exactly the same, really. So let u, a subset of the inputs, be open. Let a be in u. Let f be from u to rm. Then the kth partial derivative of this is, it looks exactly the same. So dk, ah, sorry. I'm not supposed to write that part yet. I'm supposed to write the limit. So limit as h goes to 0, 1 over h, f of a plus h e k <coughs> minus f of a. <laughs> so that's nice. That's nice. It's exactly the same. And it's still, or at least notationally, it's exactly the same. And this is denoted. Uh, dk f at a and actually your book does make it look slightly different for reasons that I never have I haven't been able to figure out uh, in this case the author of the textbook likes to also put a hat on top of the derivative so with the hat or without the hat uh, it doesn't really uh, bother me either way so such an example <coughs> we could say well how about how about f of x and y is, in the first coordinate, cosine x, uh, and the second coordinate, sine of x and y, <coughs> and in the third coordinate, mm, how about x squared plus 3yx? So in the first place, uh, in the first place, what is the, what is the signature of this function? R2 to R3, which is to say it takes, it takes elements from R2, vectors that have two components, to elements of R3, vectors which have three components. Okay, and then the question is, is, is uh, well, what's going to be, how, how are we going to do the partial derivative? Okay, so for concreteness, let's compute, uh, say, the x partial, the partial with respect to the first variable. Well, what should we do? What, what does the definition say we must do? So what if it was exactly, what, what if it was exactly that? If it was just that. Then the derivative, if, if it was just that, then the derivative would be negative sine, right? And if it was just this one, if it was just this one, then the derivative would be Right, cosine something or other, chain rule, that kind of thing. Then the last one, the last one with computing the x partial, it would be exactly what you think. Well, well, in this case, to compute the x partial, it's exactly those three in exactly that order, stacked on top of each other. Okay, they you proceed one component at a time. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, uh, y. And then for the chain rule, you have to multiply by y. y. And then the derivative of x squared plus 3yx is 2x plus 3y. Nice. So, so uh, the, where partial derivatives are concerned, which you already knew before you got here, because those were things in 24, 15, and 19, uh, for functions that have signature like this, I could ask you a problem like this. It's just like asking, 
It's just like asking three 2419 questions, because you do the one, and then the next one, and then the next one. Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay. <clears throat> but now, we kind of want to be able to compute it, what will be very important is for us to be able to compute not a partial derivative, but derivative in a sense with respect to all variables simultaneously. Not just one, <coughs> not just one at a time, but all of them at the same time. Okay, so let's discuss that for a minute. <coughs> let's consider this definition, the definition of derivative uh, in this case, in the case from reals to reals. Well, the definition of derivative there is the limit as h goes to 0, 1 over h, f of a plus h minus f of a. And the, the partial derivative, the two other partial derivatives that we just discussed look more or less just like this. Notably, they all have, got, they all have a 1 over h. But what, what we want to do, what we want, what we want is to replace we want to replace h, which is a scalar. We want to replace h with h. That's what we want. We need to we need to achieve this. So let's just as a matter just as a matter of exploration, I'm going to rewrite that formula and I'm going to replace all the scalar h's with vector h's. And I want us to take ha ha have a look at it. So in the first place. Since, since vector h is going to 0, then this can't still be a 0. What does it need to be? The origin, right? It needs to be 0 vector also. OK, so, th so we'll, we'll throw that in. And then we have 1 over h, f of a plus h minus f of a. So now, there's a serious problem here. <laughs> You cannot. <laughs> this is the problem. So, so have a look. If we just, uh, if we just, you know, like in your, in your word, in your word document, just do a s search and replace. Replace all h, h, h's which are scalars with h's that are vectors. The, the, the result doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. Okay. So, so. Uh, what I want you to see is that this divide by vector is nonsense. OK. So then I heard a nice suggestion. What was it? OK. So what if we replace? What if? So we, we don't want to replace all of them. right? We couldn't replace, for example, that one with the magnitude of h because then that'd be a scalar plus a vector. So I think you're saying just do that one? Yeah. Okay. So let's replace let's replace that one, uh, just that one, with uh, the magnitude of h. Okay, so so that so that at least in principle y you could perform that operation. Okay. Okay, so at least, at least where the add, subtract, multiply, and divide is concerned, all of those operations make sense. All of the, all of the arithmetic operations, algebraic operations make sense. However, this definition that's written on the page does not make any sense. Okay, because, because if we were to use this, if we were to use this, that would raise the question, well, why don't we use the absolute value of h up here, right? So what if, we go, what if we were to do this and then go back? <coughs> so if we go back to uh, go back to h's, then it would look like the limit as h goes to 0, 1 over absolute value h, f of a plus h minus f of a. 
So now, can this, can this definition be made workable? And the answer is, it cannot. No, they're all scalar now. A's, a is a scalar, H is a scalar. So now, so, so what I'm talking about is that now we're talking about, we're back here, R to R. So I want you to consider, how about consider of the, one of the most trivial functions to think about. F of X is X, right, the identity function. Is the identity function differentiable? It is, and you, you can tell me the derivative here and now. What's its derivative? It's one. Is its derivative one only on Tuesdays or? Always, right? At every point, its derivative is one. Well, let's, let's do this with that. Let's do this with that. So, so put this in here, then we would get the limit as h goes to zero, one over absolute h, and then if you plug a plus h in, what do you get? You get a plus h, because it's the identity function, and then if you plug a in, what do you get? You get a. And then this limit would be the limit as h goes to zero of h divided by absolute value of h. Okay, now let's consider h over absolute value of h. This function is so common that it has a name. It's called the sine function, as in S-I-G-N function. It's called, this, it's called the sine function because if h is positive, say like 10, then what is h over absolute value h? It's 1. So if you plug in 10, this is 1. If you plug in million, it's 1. If you plug in, uh, you know, 0 0.1, it's 1. But what if you plug in negative 5? It's negative 1. Because it would be negative 5 divided by the absolute value of negative 5, which is 5. So what I'm telling you is that on the left-hand side of 0, this is negative 1. On the negative side, it evaluates to negative 1. And on the positive side, it evaluates to positive 1. So, so how about this limit? It doesn't exist. This limit doesn't exist. So we can't, we can't do this. It's not enough to just take the vector and say, ah, oh, you can't divide by a vector. We'll just throw in a, we'll just throw in a magnitude. <laughs> the inverse, of in, inverse of h? No. That would be this, this same thing. OK. So does everybody see there's something <coughs> curious here? How are we going to handle, how are we going to handle what amounts to sort of like division by a vector? How are we going to handle that? So this is the problem. Uh, is sort of in, in, in microcosm. And that is that, you know, if you take a physics class, they'll tell you something, that, something like <coughs> that uh, vectors, in a sense, can, can encode two kinds of information. They, they, they encode a magnitude and also <coughs> what? Direction. A direction. And see, the thing about scalars, the thing about scalars is they are able to do both at the same time. So in particular, the scalar called 5 has length 5, and it's pointing in the positive direction. Whereas the scalar called negative 8 has length 8, and it's pointing in the negative direction. So scalars themselves are able to encode both. But, but uh, and that's without, without any funny business. So what I want you to see is that when you, when you put the absolute value on that scalar right there. The reason why the, reason why the resulting de definition of derivative breaks is because you're throwing away what? Direction. You're throwing away the direction. You're saying, um, I don't care about the direction. The, de the definition of derivative does care <laughs> about the direction. Okay? So for the exact same reason, you can't just take, you can't just take the scalar to scalar definition of derivative and change it to vectors because you can't divide by a vector and then change it to magnitude because then you lose track of the direction. So you can't do that. We've got to come up with something else and it's going to look weird 
but I have to do this 15 minute story, otherwise when I show you the definition of derivative, you'll have difficulty believing why it looks so strange. Okay? It looks strange because there's no other way to proceed because of this. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to reimagine we're going to reimagine the definition of derivative the one that you already know. We're going to write it in a different way. So in particular uh, I'd like for you to recall that what derivative means, so if this is y is f of x, what derivative at a means, it means that, well, let's, let's choose our favorite input, a. So we'll choose our favorite input, a, and then bring it up here to the function Okay, so what, what is the height there? F of A, right? At input A, the output is F of A. What the derivative is, it's saying that if the function is differentiable at the point in question, and I've drawn a function that is, then locally, if you were a little tiny creature, the world would look flat to you. And don't, don't be misled, when a mathematician says flat, they don't mean horizontal. I mean flat. Horizontal is a special case of flat where water wouldn't run anywhere. Okay? So the definition of derivative is saying, more or less, that the best approximation to the red function at input A is that blue line. That's what the definition is saying. So. <coughs> What I want you to observe is in this diagram, there's two origins, right? This is, this is, in a sense, the origin, right, over here. But there's another coordinate system that's right here. This is the local coordinates. This is where the place of tangent attachment has occurred, right? There's two of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the variables around a little bit so that this one is the origin. Okay, so in particular... This is, this is where x is a, and this is where y is f of a. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a slightly different coordinate system, and I'm going to say that this is where x with a dot hat is 0. So all that, all that dot, I know that some of you may have taken physics and may believe that, and, and, and in that context, it may be that that dot means derivative, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just, this is a different x. So this is where x dot is 0, and this one over here is where y dot is 0. Okay, so now, in the dot, in the dot coordinate system, this is now the origin, 0, 0. So what I want you to see about that being the origin is that the blue line passes through the origin, doesn't it? So in particular, in particular, it's linear. It's, the blue line is not a linear subspace of the original space, right? Why is the, why is the blue line not, not a linear subspace of the original? Because it doesn't go through this origin <coughs> over here. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, forget that origin. Let's talk about this one. Then it is linear when we're talking about that one. So. So this line, this line can be written in the dotted coordinate system as y dot is m x dot. Because every, every line through the origin can be written in that way. Y, is, y dot is m x dot. OK, good. Now, if you, if you go back to the other coordinate system, if you go back to the other coordinate system, how can we write the, the equation of this line in terms of x's and y's instead of x dots and y dots? 
But, yeah, just using the point state <coughs> formula. Yeah, this would be this would be uh, what y minus uh, f of a is m multiplied by x minus a. So what I'm saying is that those two blue equations, they're the same equation but written in two different coordinate systems. Okay, similarly, similarly, let's write the, the let's write the red, let's write the red in the in the dotted coordinate system also. So this is an xy, but I want it to be an x dot y dot. <clears throat> so how do we do it? How do we do it? <clears throat> yeah, we're going to have to do the, all the translations to get it right. So to get to get it right, uh, what do we need to be it in the dot to, for it to be in the dotted coordinate system? So what is it? Y minus f of a. Y mi so not y minus f of a. Yeah, it's going to have to be y plus f of a. So y plus f of a is what? Zero. Not zero. F of f, f of a plus x dot. Uh, I wish I wasn't writing over that part. Can you all read that? Uh, there's a there's a dot right there. Can you see that? <clears throat> okay, so now here we have it. Now here we have it written in several ways. So what we want, what we want is we could solve now for the two possibilities. On the one hand, we have the blue y dot is m x dot. That's the blue. And on the other hand, we have if we solve for the red y dot y dot is f of a plus x dot minus f of a. So now, what I want you to see, what I want you to observe, is that this right-hand side in the dotted coordinate system isn't that exactly the numerator in the definition of derivative. It is, isn't it? It looks like f of a plus h minus f of a. Okay, so now, what we want, what we want is for the, is for the red y dot, minus the blue y dot, to be small. That is to say, what we really want is we want to be able to compute the difference between the red surface and the blue surface, and we want them to be as small as possible. We want the difference between them to be small. So, in particular, we could say, uh, well, if we were to just write exactly that expression, so the red one minus the blue one, then that would be, that would be f of a plus x dot minus f of a. That's the red, and then minus mx dot. Minus mx dot. And we want this to be small. So that is the red surface minus the blue surface, and we want this to be small. Now, I've been calling the distance that we travel from a x dot, but what's the usual name that we give it? That, that's a typical name, but what was the name on all the previous pages? H. It was H on all the previous page, pages. So now let's go back to that. Let's go back to that. Back to H's. We want f of A plus H minus f of a, and then minus mh to be small. 
in the limit. So, so uh, we want it to be small, and what, what, what we mean by that is we want it to be, in particular, zero as h goes to zero. So now, if we let h go to zero, then we'd have something that looks like this, the limit as h goes to zero of this thing, <coughs> f of a plus h minus f of a minus mh. And so far, so good, but this is not, this is not enough. This, this, won't, this won't do it for us entirely, because after all, if this function is differentiable, if it's differentiable, then when you plug in h is 0 for this term, what do you get? 0. And if this function is differentiable, that means that it's also continuous there. That's a result from your previous calculus class. And if the function is continuous there, then what's the limit of this? 0. So this is not enough. So we want this to be 0, but really we want a stronger condition. We want the stronger condition to be not only do we want that limit to be zero, that's, this is altogether a strange way to write continuity. That's just a strange way to write continuity. We want it to, in fact, be differentiable there. So we have to add one bit. The limit as h goes to zero. And now I'm going to copy all of that. So, so far, all I did was copy it, but I left myself just a little bit of horizontal space because what am I going to write in, what am I going to write right in there? 1 over h. But now, what I want you to observe, <clears throat> this, this is differentiability. This is, this is equivalent to your definition of derivative. from your previous calculus class. But here's the trick now. Here's where I finally do the big reveal and pull the rabbit out of the hat. And that is that now I'm going to write exactly that. The limit as h goes to 0, f of a plus h minus f of a minus mh equal to 0. And then now I have this red 1 over h. <coughs> And remember what it was that we were trying to do about 20 minutes ago. We were trying to turn this into, an, into a definition for vectors. And we wanted to replace h's, scalar h's, with vector h's. So as it's written presently, it, it would not be permissible to replace the scalar h's with vector h's. Why not? The same problem as before. You can't divide by a vector. But now what I want you to observe is notice what the limit is. The limit is 0. The limit is 0. So what would change if we change that from h to absolute value of h? Nothing would change. Nothing would change because the right-hand side has limit 0. So here it is. This is, this is the, the new definition of derivative. So what I want you to see, what I want you to see is that we, what the whole purpose of this procedure is to separate out two items, the two items that, are, that, that, that vectors have. They have magnitude and direction. So what, what we've done here is we, we separated them. Here, this, this is taking care of the magnitude. What that's saying is that things have to be small. This is the direction. And they're being handled separately. So what you have to do in order to use this, in order to use this definition, to use this definition, You, 
compute this limit and then solve for m. So it's a bit of a strange procedure in comparison to your previous experience. However, that it's going to allow us to um, have a workable definition for derivatives uh, that we want. OK, so any question about this definition? OK. So now let's write down the definition of derivative for uh, vector value functions. So definition. Derivative from Rn to Rm. OK. So let, uh, let U be a subset of Rn open. Let A be an element in U, and let F be from set U to Rm. <clears throat> then the derivative. So notably, I'm saying the derivative and not the partial derivative. I'm saying the derivative. The derivative of f at a is the solution to the limit as vector h goes to 0, 1 over the magnitude of h. So notably, we're not dividing by a vector. We're dividing by the length of a vector multiplied by f of a plus h minus f of a. And then minus uh, m of h equal to 0, uh, equal to 0. Like so. So, where m is a linear function, So in particular, what's the, what's the signature of M? So what is it? So what, what's, the, what's the signature of F? It's this, right? So, so F is a function which takes vectors of, with N components to vectors of M components. And remember what, what the derivative is. It's the best flat approximation to a function. So if this is what the function does, then that's also what the flat thing must do. It has to take, it has to take vectors like so and produce vectors like so. So m ha must be rn to rm. Now, you all had to take linear algebra. You all had to take linear algebra. And one of the main results, if, yeah, it's not too much to say, main result of linear algebra, is that linear functions from Rn to Rm are representable using <coughs> what? Ma matrices. So M is representable. So, of course, understand what I mean is that when this limit exists, if you can't, if you can't solve for m, then, then the function is not differentiable at the point in question. So supposing, supposing that you can solve for m and you found it, then m is representable uh, 
as a matrix uh, of size of size what? So let's 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 figure out the two possibilities. We have m by n, and then the other one that students always want to suggest is this one. So let's which one sh which one should it be when you're doing matrix multiplication? So remember that we're going to do matrix matrix times h. That's what we're going to do. So now. What, what, what size is H? N by, one. n by 1. So this is N by 1. As a result, as a result, what needs to be the, the size, the rows and columns for matrix M? It's got to be, it's got to be something by N, right? You've got to have an N right here. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, an amenable matrix product. So the other one is M. So generally with matrices, with matrices, this is the size of the input. So size of the input. And this one is the size of the output. OK. Interesting. So any question, any question about this? This definition. Notably, I haven't. You know, you might be wondering. Wow, I'm not. At, I'm not at all sure, at the present time, if he was to give, if he were to give me a function right here and now, <laughs> I'm not sure I could compute the derivative. <laughs> so you might, you might have that impression. But, and we're gonna, we're gonna remedy that in just a moment. But besides that particular concern, besides that particular concern, is there any question about this definition? Yeah. So since we have that, the prime. Right, that's right. It, it's going to be m by 1 because it's got to land in here. Okay. Okay, good. Yes? Just real fast, so the written formula here is solution to this. This? Yeah. So that m, it's not m, uh, h is a function, or that m is, I'm sorry. It's not m as a function of h. Like it's yes, m is a function of h. It is m as a function of h. Yeah, and then when, when the style <coughs> in the book and the style that we're adopting is that when you... When m is a linear function, then, then one of the results of linear algebra is that every linear function is representable as a matrix. So what I mean by m with square brackets, with brackets around it, is the matrix of m. At when, when, because, because, and this is, this, you can always find this by, because m is linear. Yes? So earlier you said that That's right. How do we know the Because that's the way we that's the way we defined it. So it was right it was right here. What we we were on this page, and it was saying that we want the difference between the red and the blue surfaces to be small. Right? When 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 the distance from the attachment point is small, we want the distance between red and blue to be small. So we considered this is red, this is this is red. And that's blue. So if you do the distance between these two in limit is zero, this is continuity. Any line that goes through that point would work, even if I was to take this one and turn it. Like this, this dashed line would work. It would work. So, so this definition by itself means continuity. So to make it even smaller, to make it be dif differentiability, I added the 1 over h. Because, because consider. If the, distance, if, if the distance between these two is small and their limit is zero, that's one thing. But consider further, what is 1 over h doing as, as h goes to zero? It's getting infinitely big, right? Supposing that you're staying on one side. Then it's going to be infinitely positive or infinitely negative. At, or, well, let, let's say it better like this, arbitrarily big or arbitrarily small. So, so... If this difference, the difference between red and blue in limit is going to zero even when you're dividing by h, then this is getting really small indeed. So this, this is the definition of differentiability. And then my comment was, 
that suppose that suppose n notice that the right hand side is zero because the right hand side is zero there's no objection to us replacing this h with absolute value of h because in the end we're defining the limit to be zero so does that answer it other questions <clears throat> yes this one Okay, okay. So let, let's be clear. Uh, this is an aside. That, that it is M is being evaluated at H. But because M is linear, because M is linear, you can find a matrix which represents M. And the way you denote that is in this way. So what this is, this is the matrix which represents, I need a P, represents M. So for example, if we were to say, I could say M of X and Y and I could say that it is equal to something like uh, 3x plus y, and then how about y minus x? Well, m is a linear function. You know, I, I could set you to the task of, well, show that it's homogeneous, show that it's additive. You, 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 could, you could sit down and you could, you could establish that. Be and because m is linear, because it's linear, you can represent this as matrix multiplication. Okay, so now, now be, because we're doing it, let's, let's just get into it. Since if one student has this question, near, probably all of you do. So be brave, right? You've got to let me know if something's not clear, otherwise I'll just march on. So we have this, we have this function here. 3x plus y, y minus x, and then I could ask, what is the matrix of m? How do you compute the matrix of m? Well, how do you, how do you figure out the first column of the matrix of m? You plug in the first basis vector. How do you figure out the second column of m? The second basis vector. And if suppose this was a really big function, and I said, well, how do we figure out the 2,451st column of M? You plug in that basis vector, right? So, so as a result, we could say, well, let's plug in 1, 0. What do you get if you plug in 1, 0? You get, uh, yes, 3, negative 1. And what do you get if you plug in 0, 1? Uh, 1, 1. As a result, as a result, you can now tell me that the matrix of M is what? 3, negative 1, 1, 1. So as a result, therefore, you can represent M of X and Y as 3, negative 1, 1, 1, X, Y. So what I want you to do is compare and contrast. This is a linear function, but until you're used to it, it may, it may not be entirely obvious what the matrix of this linear function is. Well, you could just as well represent this function in this way, and this is the matrix representation. So what I'm saying in this definition, solve for the linear function if there is one, and furthermore, if there is one, then it's representable as a matrix. Okay. How are we doing on time? Lots of time. Okay. So now, for those of you that are, that are, uh, that are concerned that, well, what if, what, if he, what if right now he gave me a function? <laughs> he gave me a function that mapped, say, R3 to R8 and said, Compute the derivative. 
<laughs> what, what would you do? Cry, right? That would be the first step. The first step would be to cry. <laughs> and that's also the second step. Will you grade our tears and like turn on today? Yeah, I mean, all these things are possible. Okay. So, so, remark. Or even definition. So this definition is called the Jacobian matrix. Okay. Again, let U as a subset of Rn be open. Let A be in U. Let F be a function from U to Rn. Then, the Jacobian matrix, Jacobian, Jacobian, is U supposed to go into R N or R M? Should be R M, thank you. Outputs are of size M. Then the Jacobian matrix. of F at A is, so in the first place, going to be denoted in this way. So J of F at A. So the square brackets in this case are indicating that we're talking about a matrix. J for Jacobian, A because that's the point in question, F because that's the function in question. This is <coughs> going to be, uh, the, the, the easiest possible thing that you could possibly imagine. Okay, so then how many variables are there? Input variables. There's n input variables. And how many, how many outputs are there? M outputs. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to say that it is the following matrix. It is the first partial of F is the first column. <clears throat> first partial is the first column. Second partial is the second column. <clears throat> and then how far do we have to go? N, right? <clears throat> Pardon me. So let's think about this for a moment. Let's think about this for a moment. F is Rn to Rm. Now we're only talking about it, we're only talking about it on set U, but what I want you to understand is that F is a, the kind of thing that F is. It's the kind of thing that takes an input of n variables and produces an output of size m. So that's what it does. Its linear approximation, its flat approximation, should be doing exactly the same thing. It should take something like this and produce something like that. Okay, so this is a matrix. Column, 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 column. Now, what's the size of this matrix? M by N. In the first place, so, so now I'm going to check. You might just have memorized that from a couple pages ago. Let me ask it like this. How many columns does this matrix have? Why does this matrix have n columns? Because there were n variables. And there's one column per variable. One, two, n. Okay, so that means that, means that it's n and then something like that. And then now, now, when you compute F, how many outputs does F have stacked on top of each other? M. M. So, so, what is the size of this column? And rows. Right, it's M by one, right? M rows, one column. M rows, one column. M rows, one column. So, how many? 
M. So are these in agreement? <coughs> are these in agreement? They are. You need to be careful, though, because <laughs> it's always a little disturbing that, that, you know, when you write the signature like this, things of size N to things of size M, and then these are reversed. They're, re they're reversed because when you do matrix multiplication, the inputs are on the right, right? You put the H right there. But. So, do we have time to do one example? Yeah, we do. So, for example, <clears throat> suppose that we have this function, f of x and y is xy in the first coordinate, sine of x plus y in the second, <coughs> and then x squared minus y squared in the third. So in the first place, please tell me, what is the signature of f? Two to three, right? So uh, two, I said two, and then now I'm writing n. Two to three. So that means we're going to compute the Jacobian, and how many columns should there be? Two columns. Two columns because there's two inputs. And how many rows should there be? Three rows because there's three outputs. Okay. <clears throat> so let's, let's calculate uh, J, F, at X, and Y. So the output shape should look like this. Some column, some other column, the last column. No. <laughs> Like so, because there's two inputs. <clears throat> what goes in the first column? The partial of the all of these, the partial of this vector with respect to x. So, what's the what goes in the top? What goes in in the next one? Cosine x plus y. And what goes down here? Two x. So all of the x partial information is right here. And what goes in the next one? All the y partial information. Uh, so that would be what? x, and then cosine uh, x plus y, and then negative 2y. <coughs> Interesting. So now, we didn't, have, we didn't get to it today, but here's a question that I want you to think about. So what we did is we wrote the definition of the Jacobian matrix. And immediately before that, we wrote the definition of the derivative. How do you think these two things are related? They're, they're very often the same. When the function is differentiable, this is the derivative. But this can exist even if the function isn't differentiable. And we'll talk about that next time. So have a nice day.